I need to know what I know, what I need to focus on and what's going to make me successful and also provide the best value back to my customers, which then also, by the way, gives them more trust in me mm. because I'm a great resource on that specific subject. Welcome to the Profitable Property Manager Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Moyla. Today, I'm talking to Allison DeSaro from Enterprise Bank and Trust. How you doing, Allison? I'm good. I'm good. Very happy to be here. Yeah. Glad to be yeah. jamming with you. We've known each other for a while. Um, and I think, you know, when I thought about, like, what are we going to talk about? What do I want to navigate the conversation? The first thing that I wanted to talk to you about was how to do business relationally. Mm -hmm. When I think about a relational sale, a relational connection, I think about you. Oh, thank you. It's very interesting to me in really banking, nice. with all of the banking experience that I have, that I have zero meaningful in uh, relationships with anybody in banking outside of you. It's become really clear to me that the expectation you should have of your banker is mm -hmm. to not know them or get a call back or right. have any kind of yeah. real relationship. And yet, <clears throat> here we are having this conversation. It's just kind of an anomaly. Can you kind of help me understand more about why it is so uncommon in banking to have personal relationships and why that's different in your situation? Yeah. So this is just my opinion. I think, first of all, banking in general is just so transactional, right? Like lending is not really what I do, but let's say you have a lender, right? You close the deal, you move on. And or some context too, because you know I'm a very candid person, they're usually paid once the deal's closed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just very transactional. And and there's a lot to keep up with in banking. We depending on which bank you're with, you know, you have really, really high goals. You gotta just keep it churning, keep it going. I think why it works for me is right off the top of my head, I'm not a banker. First and foremost, I'm not a banker. I'm a property management banker. I never did anything prior to this banking wise. Mm. I came into this in a really interesting way, um, into banking, I mean, I'm sorry. And then, and I got into property management. That's what made me stay mm. in the banking industry. Um, and, you know, I think that for me, it just, it, it's, it is very different. Like you said, it's very different than how other people in the bank do things for me, even in my bank. Like we have all these teams that do different things and I don't, I don't know, I can't speak for all of them, but I don't think it's as, you know, what we say sticky, right? The, the relationships are as sticky as maybe it is on my end. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it's that difficult. I'm sure it's just it's more just like logistical reasons, how they get paid, how they're doing things. Also just who they are as people and what they value and in, in their business, what they get from their business. For me, it's, and I mean this in a very healthy way, my business really feeds my ego and not because... I think I'm the best at what I do. I mean, that's not what I mean by the ego. Like it really makes, it's something that I know I do really well and not just the banking side of it, the relationship side of it. And so it feeds me, feeds my ego. And I truly, because of my like empathetic nature, I truly love these relationships. Mm. I would rather hold the relationship than just make money off of it. Mm. How long have you been in the business for? Uh, since 2010. So almost 14 years, December 2010. I remember Enterprise coming on my radar maybe eight years ago or so, um, or the you specifically. It actually wasn't Enterprise. It was yeah. Seacoast yeah. at the mm -hmm. time. Different right, bank. Tooth merger. In terms of the value prop of why the relationship matters, it's not just great rapport, right? I mean, there actually is a material mm -hmm. financial benefit. Can you just outline mm -hmm. what exactly that, that value proposition is for property managers? The benefits? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So the mo there's a couple things. What I say, there's there's the monetary value prop, there is the um, compliance and specialty, and then there is really just the customer interaction, customer dedication. So the um, monetary, which is, I think is what you're asking, mm -hmm. right? So what that is, is that's a, it's a program called analysis. And quite frankly, most banks can do it, and this is not something new to banks. It really just depends which bank you're with, if it's going to work for you or against you, and also right now, which rate environment you're in as well, right? Mm -hmm. So in general, the way that it works, 
it's a credit that the customer can earn based off of their entire balance relationship at the bank um, to earn a credit. Very similar to interest. There's benefits to why you would want it to be an earnest credit and not interest. Um, but they earn these credits to first offset any transaction fees, right? So I always say you get free banking, you just get more transparency in how you get that free banking um, if you're in a good analysis program, of course. And then whatever's left over based off of what you earned and had to offset first, those are net credits that a lot of people call them soft money, right? Like I can't give it to you, the property mm -hmm. management company, mm -hmm. because it's not interest. Cannot read as interest on your books or our books, um, but we can pay directly to third party vendors. Mm -hmm. Normally have to be accounting banking related because that's what the regulation says, um, unless you have you know, a partnership for instance. Um, so it's non-taxable income that still offsets your bottom line. Mm. And there's a variety of partners that where that's applicable to, mm -hmm. lead simple being one of those mm -hmm. relationships. Yeah. And that adds a lot of value for our customers to be able to see that accrete over time. And it accretes at the rate of the size of their operation. Mm -hmm. What I found is this becomes pretty material for the, the larger size companies. Um, the types of property management companies that you work with, is it exclusively single family? Is it also multi? Is it HOA? What's the scope of what you deal with? Yeah, so we have yesterday, actually, I, I ran the numbers before I went up to um, to talk to NARPM audience. We have over $2.2 billion in property management deposits, balances, as of yesterday. Um, that includes HOA and what, what we call property management, right? Um, mostly property management, which is basically any trust account type of money. Now, I can't tell you, like, accurately what those numbers are if we were break to break them up into percentages of which is single family, which is multifamily. Um, the majority of that portfolio, absolutely hands down a single family. Mm. Then there's, I would say, if you were looking at it on a graph, it's probably single family, then uh, HOA, then multifamily and commercial. We do a small portion of vacation rentals. Um, it's not that we don't, I mean, we'll bank any of it. Anything that requires a trust account, because that's my specialty, we'll take it. We just don't really market that much to them. So a lot of that business is just referral business. So of the value prop that you articulated, you talked about the relational connection, monetary benefit, mm -hmm. and then the compliance piece. Talk to mm -hmm. me about the compliance. So, yeah, so the compliance, I think, is really the, the top two things that really set us apart is the compliance and the customer dedicate or the, the industry dedication, I should say. Um, so the compliance, you know, when I became a banker, when I got hired to do this this job at the time, which was just a business development job, it had nothing to do with property management, um, I was told that they wanted, for lack of a better word, but this is what the banks call it, sticky deposits, right? And I knew that um, property management companies have those sticky deposits, not the most eloquent word, um, but uh, or term, but so... I went out and tried to get that business, and I very quickly realized there's so much compliance needed there. So I could have been just a banker that just banked property management companies just like any other bank down the street, but I realized what was going to get them, what was going to attract them more was if I knew the compliance. So I had to first realize, like, okay, wait, what's the compliance missing? And it's very interesting because a lot of people focus on the state compliance for trust accounts. When I say compliance, Sorry, let me stop and say, when I say compliance, I'm talking about the trust account setup itself at the bank. Mm -hmm. So I spoke with, for instance, I remember Jennifer Newton. Jennifer Newton is one of the first people I spoke with. And she said, well, no one really knows how to actually set these up. So no one actually really has a true trust account. So I had to work with um, the state uh, auditors. And then I realized it wasn't just about what the state says, because what California says might be different than what Texas says, right? So I realized that's why everyone doesn't really have a quote unquote trust account because people who don't even work for banks are telling you how to set up your bank account um, just to meet their standards. So really you have to be able to set up the trust accounts at the bank level so that the accounts are protected from what I think, what I say is more federal protection, right? So like let's scrap the state rules for a minute. From a federal standpoint, they have to be protected from you know, of course, lack of FDIC insurance, which is what we're all talking about these days, um, governing entity liens, lawsuits, judgments, you know, tax levies, whatever it may be, because the way that the banks set these accounts up, they look like they are the customer, so the property management company's assets. 
they're not, they're assets, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to set them up, invest them correctly as true trust accounts so that each beneficiary is the asset holder, not the property management company. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult, um, pro I don't really love this word, but product for banks to understand because it's not, the setup is not typical and the documentation is not typical to what you would get if you were opening up your family's trust account, for instance which is what banks know as trust accounts, right? So did the offering itself, the underlying structure of the offering shift over time as you kind of delved deeper into it and got clearer on the compliance requirements? I would say I probably wasn't even that successful in the development, the business development of it for probably the first two and a half years. Um, I was certainly in the first two and a half years meeting the, you know, at that point I was only working in California. So I was meeting the California Department of Real Estate rules on what the trust account needed to be. And that that was like you said, that was that's how it kind of developed because I would realize, OK, you know, this is meeting the California Department of Real Estate of standards. So when someone would go through an audit, which in California happens all the time, they would pass those audits. But then the conversation would come up about, well, what if I get sued? Actually, to be honest, there was one specific um customer, well, they were actually a customer who was onboarding to us, but they were coming from another bank who said, I'm coming from this bank. I just got a franchise tax levy lien and the bank froze the client trust fund. So he couldn't actually move them over to me. Mm. And that was very early on. That was like, I mean, he was one of my very first customers. So I don't even know, probably like the first year and a half or so. Um, and I realized, well, wait, the Department of Real Estate standards aren't protecting that, right? Um, so what would happen if he was with us, right? So then I had to do a deeper dive. So then I spent a very long time then not just meeting with auditors. So that was from the state level. The auditors were always from the state level. Then I started meeting with FDIC, uh, regulatory attorneys. Um, my uh, old CEO was had a lot of connections in the Federal Reserve. So I just really kind of like tapped everyone. And then that's when the when it developed into more of like, you know, Federal. This is what we're, we now need to, need to focus on the federal trust account compliance, and not just what each state says. So this is pretty far from a typical function of a of a business development manager. What you're describing. And at that time, it wasn't even a property management division. I was just a business development officer on a local little branch bank um, who was told to go get sticky deposits. So I just focused on the property. It was just your intuition. So. I mean, it wasn't, I won't say it was just my intuition. I actually, my um, predecessor who was leaving, I had just moved from Massachusetts to San Diego. He was moving from San Diego to Massachusetts. And he said, you know, what money you should really look at is property management money. And I knew that because I had actually a long time prior worked for a property management company. So I did understand, definitely didn't understand the compliance needs or anything like that. But I understood the very basics of, oh, well, Rent money comes in, it goes back out, but security deposits stay, right? So I knew that. So because I had that knowledge, and to be honest, I was very insecure in the very, very beginning because I really had no business being a banker. <laughs> um, I went and I just focused, laser focused on that because mm -hmm. I knew that part of it. So I figured, okay, I can figure that out. But like I said, then I realized there was, it's not that I couldn't bank other customers or other property management companies. It's just that, like I wasn't really solving any problem for them. I mean, I could give them some earnings credits, but so could other banks, right? So once I realized, like, this is what's going to differentiate us, then I started doing that. Um, so not until, and I just only did that. I didn't do anything else. I didn't focus on any other companies. And, like, they wanted me, you know, the bank wanted me to go down and get the restaurant down the street, right? Because I was that's local banking. I didn't do any of that. I just stayed the course and went with property management. And after... We a few years in, so that that was in 2010. We didn't really start the like actually form a true division, mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. then, it was mm -hmm. pretty early on until late 2012. All right, so some things are becoming more clear. This is the yeah. power of niching down, mm -hmm. and part of yeah. the magic of you being able to be relational in the way that you are is that you're in a small enough pool. I mean, property management isn't that small, but it's a whole hell of a lot smaller than small business in general. Yeah. Part of the problem with my banking interactions is that I look nothing like the 50 other people that they just talked to before and they will talk to after, mm -hmm. whereas you have common knowledge, comprehension, understanding, and actual relationships, right? Like the per first person you talk to knows the second person, third person. Mm -hmm. It compounds. Mm -hmm. 
I'm really interested in business in compounding gains where the longer that I stay, everything I'm doing is just really compounding, increasing over time. Mm-hmm. I see it gets the easier. Here. I wanted to hear more about what would be some specific use cases or scenarios where somebody would benefit and be hedged from the compliance attention that you're describing as opposed to banking with ABC Bank down the bank? What's the specific event where they would be Mm -hmm. like, I wish that hadn't happened, but given that it did, I'm glad I'm banking with you guys. So, I mean, certainly, again, like I said, lack of FDIC insurance. I don't really necessarily think that's that's the reason I say that is because that's what I think a lot of people would say right now because they see these banks going under. And if they didn't have their trust accounts set up correctly, then what would have happened to their money? I don't really love focusing on that because, again, I'm a pretty candid person. I'll just say, well, at the end of the day, even if they were set up right, doesn't really or or weren't right, it doesn't really matter because the banks these days are probably just going to get bailed out anyway, right? So what I focus on and I actually think is most important. So you really shouldn't be looking at just the strength of your bank right now. It really still should be narrowed back down to the division there. Well, I guess maybe a lot of these banks don't have property management divisions, but like the knowledge, right? Because and the policies and procedures, because perfect case scenario, company gets sued. Or let's go back to this company that had a franchise tax board lien, mm-hmm. right? This happens a lot. Franchise tax board or any governing entity sends an intent to lien to the bank. Uh, let's just throw out numbers. Let's say that was $200,000 levy. The bank is going to pull any accounts under the property management's tax ID number. These trust accounts are under the property management company's tax ID number because they're trustees for these funds. If those accounts are not set up correctly, which most of the time they're not, and that property management company has, I'm actually giving you an actual uh, situation of a customer, but not exact numbers. Uh, Let's say that company has $100,000 in their business operating account. That gets frozen. Now the rest is frozen. It has to be frozen, right? The the extra $100,000, that's going to come from a trust account, money that's not theirs, Mm -hmm. but it's frozen. Can't touch it. And they're handicapped. it's done. Like you can't, you can't just say unfreeze it, right? Um, they were ordered to freeze by a governing entity. So it's not that you lose that money. I mean, you do, you could at some point, it really depends on the case. Um, but that customer specifically, the one who I was telling you about earlier on, um, trying so hard here not to say names, he, um, he, he lost, he, he was out several, I mean, it was not a hundred thousand dollars. It was almost a hundred thousand dollars, but I think it was like around 70 something thousand dollars. He was out for a long period of time. And that was, he was with another bank. He moved the rest of his money over to us. And I knew he was out for for a long period of time because he had to go to court for like eight months Mm. to prove to a judge that this money didn't belong to him. And at that point, what happens after that? Even if you do get the money back from the judge, right? Totally hobbled. Yeah, your your customers know. You're gonna lose, you're gonna um, not pass an audit, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. now you're gonna probably lose your license. Mm -hmm. You've lost customers, you've lost your license. Um, if they were set up with us, that would have never happened. Mm. Mm. And that does happen a lot with us. We get a lot of levies from customers. It's And it's not because they didn't, usually not because they didn't pay their taxes or whatever. It's usually from lawsuits. And that's why I think it's important because in this industry, I mean, you hear it all the time, especially since COVID, the amount of lawsuits um, that this industry faces, if there's a governing entity, if there's a lien, a governing entity is a, is a court, if there's a lien, on those funds, um, the bank has to freeze them if they belong to them. So we get those all the time for customers. We will freeze what we can that has to do with the business assets, but anything beyond that, trust account assets, we're not, we will not touch. How do you manage to keep up with so many folks at the level of latency that you do, which is to say you tend to respond pretty quickly to folks reaching out to you. And the the ups are the downside of what I said previously of people kind of equating you as being the bank is like the one thing. The downside is people want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. You know, upside, people want to talk to you. Downside, people want to talk to yes, you. I How know. do you manage and navigate that without becoming a victim of your own success, essentially? Well, I will be very honest that for a very long time, I was a victim of my own success. Truly. I struggled. Like, it was. it's very hard for me. I, I really lead with empathy. And I have since I was a very young. And I think that that is a blessing and a curse because I will beat myself up over other people's problems that have nothing to do with me. Um, so I, I had to really, I don't know, to be honest. So it's now been almost 14 years. Um, 
I really struggled with it for a very long time, up until really just about two years ago. I um, just went through a hard time personally, and I had to, I was forced to really step back and lean on other people. And it had to be people that I trusted to take care of the people who, my relationships, who right? You. Who trust me. And, and honestly, a lot of these people, not all thousands of my clients, but like a lot of people I have personal relationships with as well, which even increases the empathy factor, right? So um, I was really forced to really just take a step back and find the people that I trusted um, to help me and then make sure that I could introduce those people to my clients and show them that they can trust them as well and that they were really just part of my team. So it wasn't couldn't just be somebody on my team. It had to be someone who was like me, led the same way as me, um, really knew how important the relationships were to me and made those relationships important to them. So, you know, we brought some team members, we brought some extra team members on, team members that were actually also a team member that was already with us, who I think has made the biggest difference for me. Um, but he wasn't, we weren't working as closely together. I really had to just give up control and our personalities matched, it worked. So now I make sure that my clients, not everyone, but you know, when they come to me, I make sure that they know this is also someone you can trust. This is someone who's very similar to me. Um, not a shares completely different personality shares our values. Um, we even like, for instance, we we had we hired. I had gone through assistance, not gone through for any reason other than they really just wanted to move on and you know, you know, excel in their career. Um, and there, it always worked, but it wasn't someone that I would put client facing with my clients. Uh, the one that I have now, I hate to even call her assistant because she is like my right hand, and I adore her, and I know that she really values the client relationships um so i can very easily step away if i need to and know that people are taken care of mm. the last time banking was really in the highlight was the bank failures that happened most recently mm -hmm. the time before that was ppp mm -hmm. and i want to talk to you and hear some of the background story of what that was like for you it was interesting to me to see this immediate focus you know that the um more recent banking situation was like Lost Virgin, really, really motivating. I don't want to lose my money. Uh -huh. But PPP was... Panic. PPP was a different kind of panic, though. Like this money, in, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking like $100 bills falling from the sky and people trying to grab them with their fists. It must. It was wild on my side watching it and being a part of it. I can't imagine what it was like on yours. Walk me through what that experience was like. Triage. Truly triage. It's interesting because when I was talking earlier about empathy and how it can really be a curse for me, I almost mentioned PPP. Because actually, I'm not a lender. I'm not an SBA lender. Our bank is a giant SBA lender. SBA was, of course, putting um, offering the PPP. To see overnight, this all happened overnight, the amount of panic that set in from so many, I mean, not just customers, from peers, customers, friends, everyone needed, they were so afraid, They right? They were so afraid, they, they, it was the unknown, they, they thought they needed it. Some really did need it. Some probably didn't, right? But it was the fear of not knowing whether or not what would happen if you didn't have it. That, I'm not kidding. I mean, it took me months to recover. It's still, I feel like I have PTSD from PPP um, because I wasn't the lender. I wasn't even someone who could offer that, but I had to really just like stay up literally all, like all night, pull the strings. We had an amazing SBA team, amazing SBA team, but... I don't think, and it's not to pat myself on the back, but I don't think my clients would have gotten it as quickly and as efficiently if I didn't push my team to do it. Mm. I'm sure you remember Cabbage. Mm -hmm. I remember Cabbage. That. I, that totally came to mind for yes. me. Yes. So we actually, in the very beginning, again, this was new to us as well, right? We we're a giant SBA lender, but this was going to be a different ball game. Day one, essentially. So hour one, we said we're going to use Cabbage because a lot of the banks were using these fintech companies to just process out these SBA loans. It's going to be too much for us to take on. It was at that point, it was going to be a little bit of a risk from the SBA for us to take it on. Um, so we didn't want to take on that risk. So we, as in the bank, so we started the process of Cabbage. It was absolute shit show, mm -hmm. horrible fielding calls left and right. People, and again, people are asking me to help with. Now a, a company that I don't even work for, right? I don't work for Cabbage. I'm not in Cabbage's system. I'm not a developer um, because Cabbage kept shutting down. 
So this was on, don't quote me, it was a Saturday or a Sunday. I think it was even Easter weekend. I can't remember. But I, um, the timeline probably doesn't match. But it was a weekend, I remember. And I called my CEO and I said, we have to take these in. Like We have to. I pleaded with him. And next day, we started taking them all in-house. So we just, I literally, I pleaded with him. Like I was, it was so hard for me. Um, and then, so that night I heard back from him and he said, we'll start taking them in-house in the morning. And it just was all hands on deck for, I don't even know if it was weeks or if it was days. It is all such a blur. It was just everyone, all hands on deck, all other business stopped, just fielding, 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 trying to get people assigned, trying to get, you know, collect documentation. I'm not a lender. I'm not definitely not an SBA lender. I didn't even know half the documentation that I was being ordered to collect, but we just had to get everything. And we got every single one of our customers who requested them a PPP loan, um, which was kind of unheard of in, in a very short amount of time because our runway was delayed, right? Like we, we waited quite a few days, um, but we got everyone one and it was very thankful that he trusted me and he he decided to take on the the risk why was it that important to you to make that up i just couldn't see it's really just personal to me i just can't see people feel so panicked and in need i really can't it's a personal thing to me it is not a business thing to me it is very personal it really like tugs at me when i see people in such fear and distress mm. and i just had to do it i just didn't want to let people down and you know in hindsight I know that like it, I, it really wasn't up to me it wasn't it wasn't for me to do right I'm, I'm not an SBA lender but I just had to get them the resources hmm. I don't know I mean thankfully I think that maybe my leverage at the company kind of helped that right but um it's not that I would have walked away if we couldn't do it but it, it would have really torn me apart if we couldn't have gotten um if we couldn't at, it's not that if we couldn't gotten everyone one, because honestly, that's we're like unicorns for doing that. Not everyone could get everyone a PPP loan at their banks, but um, more so that we just didn't try. I wanted to show everyone that we may not always get it right, but we're going to try. We're going to try our hardest. That's what's most important. You can't always get everything right, mm. um, but we're going to put our best effort in. When I think about what I'm up to at business, it definitely is a lot bigger than trying to make money. Making money is exciting. Yeah, yeah. I'm not above that, beyond that. Sure. It's a significant focus for me. And I am spending more time at work than I am with my family. Not because I'm a compulsive workaholic, although I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. It's simply because between nine and five, I'm working. And mm -hmm. after hours, there's dinner time, a little school time prep beforehand, and then we go to bed and we start over. And because I'm spending so much time at work, I want to get something out of it than just a paycheck. Mm -hmm. When you hear somebody say, it's just a job, it's just your work, my first thought is, if that's how you think about it, it's probably true for you. Mm -hmm. You know, It can definitely be just a job, but it also could be more than that. And that shouldn't be up to your employer to determine for you. Right. It's really a function of like the self-generated meaning, the assigned meaning that you place. When you think about what you've gotten out of your career, aside from a, a paycheck, what is it? What comes to mind for you? I think a, probably a lot more faith in myself. Um, pr pride. Mm. I'm, I am, um, you know, you tend to, when you go through like tumultuous times, you tend to like, or at least maybe you don't tend to, because I had a life of tumultuous times. But then uh, recently, like I said, a couple of years ago, I started going through a tough, tougher time personally. And I had to really look back on, it wasn't just the current events, it was like everything, the whole life leading up to the current events. And you have to start to look at other things. So now I kind of look back at myself as like, I look at myself as just as another person. Like I, I, I'm I, kind of outside of my body looking at myself. I'm proud of that girl mm. who just really just probably needed a little bit, I, I needed that boost of confidence, right? I probably needed that. I, I don't think I realized ever that I needed it prior. Um, and I'm really proud of that girl for what she did and what she overcame. And, um, a lot of it had to do with business part of it. Like I found, I found something that I knew I could do it. It was almost like I wasn't lost in my path anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I found something that I knew I could do. I could do it really well. Um, 
granted, there's there's perks like, you know, the way that it provides for my family or or what it provides. Um, but that it's not because of what it provides. It's because I did something that I always wanted to. I almost manifested it. Mm. I wanted the and I'm a big I'm very big into manifestation. Um, I manifested it. I didn't have that. Right. And it's not that it's not about the money. It really isn't about that. It's just I wanted it gave me purpose. That's really what it is. And I felt for most of my life in hindsight, which again, I probably didn't realize then, but now I'm looking back on everything. Mm. I needed that valuable purpose. And that's what this gave me. Mm. And so these relationships give me purpose. Mm -hmm. That's probably why I lead with empathy so much. And mm -hmm. actually, to be honest, I don't lead with empathy. Empathy leads me. <laughs> that's really what it is. Empathy drives me. And that's why sometimes it can be really hard. Um, but it really just gave me much more of just personal satisfaction. Mm. It, 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 all these things I didn't, I always wanted for myself or, or what I should say probably is I wanted to make sure I didn't have for, I didn't have when I grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't. And it's a lot of it is because of, of course, my, my family, but my business and it all just kind of, it's all full circle for me. Mm. I'm processing as you're saying this, a lot of this is relatable. I'm thinking about what I get out of the relationships to say it's the relationships, both rings true, but it's also like not as specific. Based on what you reflected back, the thing that's coming to mind to me that it specifically is so meaningful is the faith and the trust that people are placing mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. That is like mm -hmm. really affirming of like, wow, like I'm stewarding this thing. Yes. Based on the way I'm Nailed stewarding it. it, I could facilitate a really big outcome for these people. Yes. And when I do to, to, man, to see people win is just like so... Yes. enlivening you know it's yeah. like it's it's so it's so much bigger than i sell x i mean you're in banking i'm in software whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's nice but is it the service not really no it's seeing people's lives shift in a way that is really meaningful for them right that to me would be the same if i was running a nonprofit or a school or whatever yeah. and i think about that a lot is like what's the way i want to be how do i want to show up that transcends the specific context that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I need to be a master of my context, but I don't want to get so lost in it that I lose sight of like the global, like what kind of human do I want to be? How do I want to interact with people? Right. That's what really centers and grounds me when I can stay focused on it. Right. And I think that that's, you know, you heard, I'm sure you've heard the um, expression, you put the gas mask on first, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in some weird way, that's actually back to your earlier question about like, how do I separate now business and life, right? Um, I realized for I was probably drowning for years because I just needed to please everyone to make sure everyone was doing well. Mm -hmm. And I started to see a little bit of a decline there, um, obviously personally, but I wasn't focused on that. But like in business, I saw a little bit of a decline. The work was not fun for me to go to anymore. I, mm -hmm. I just was so, I was doing it but I was stressed and I was succeed from a numbers perspective, like succeeding like crazy, but I wasn't stopping to pat myself on the back. Mm. Like I stopped giving myself that hypothetical pat on the back. Mm. So I think stopping and putting the gas mask on first, mm. which took me a while, right? Um, and I was kind of forced into it, but I did it. And then I realized, wow, I'm, this is, now I love, I'm mm. back to loving it again. Amazing. Amazing. And I do stop and give myself a pat on the back. And I will say I'm proud of myself. And I will, you know, come home and tell my husband about something fun before. It was just like, I don't want to work. <laughs> you know, for a long period of time, it was just, I got to work. I got to answer all the calls at all times. I mean, I work in, with clients on every single time zone. My team mm -hmm. is on three hours mm -hmm. um, uh, behind me. So which makes me feel like I'm behind. Right. So and now I just got to put the gas mask on first, mm -hmm. take care of myself. And that that benefits me because I see how well it's benefiting my relationships, both mm -hmm. personally and professionally, because I really, I'm trying to now take care of myself as well. You use the word manifesting. When some people hear that, they're really allergic, other people yeah. are really attracted. I'll speak for myself. When I yeah. hear that word, what it affirms in me is the idea that it's all made up. Mm -hmm. Everything, the whole thing, all of business, it's made up. It's made up in the sense that if you think that life is supposed to be hard. If you think that success comes from grinding, and suffering, mm -hmm. then you'll find more of those mm -hmm. things, you know? Exactly. And that's yep. the tool you'll pick up and mm -hmm. default to. And boy, do I have some of that wiring. It, it's like, uh, it's it's what? Some like Puritan work ethic, 
if I suffer, that's my sacrifice to earn the thing that I want. I should need to sacrifice. It needs to cost me something. And the dichotomy that I found is that I actually think that's true on some level, but what I want it to cost me is courage. Sure. Not my family, not my relationships. I want it to cost me the courage to have hard, uncomfortable conversations with myself and other people. Um, not working 80 hours a week and not having relational health. So there is a price, but like what you make up about what it's supposed to cost really determines what you find. That's been my experience. That's interesting. I, um, especially the courage part, because I mean, I'm sure you're an entrepreneur. I know you're in software. I'm sure you get scared with all new things still, right? I, I regularly, yeah. I'm scared to come up here and do this podcast, <laughs> right? Okay, but here we are. <laughs> but here we are. And I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be so happy about it afterwards. Mm. And the same, I mean, our, our acquisition, right? When we were acquired by Enterprise. I was just thinking this this morning, actually. I was so scared about that acquisition. I did a, I think I did an okay job about making sure other people weren't so scared, but I'm really not like a move your cheese type person. <laughs> I do not want anyone to move my cheese. Um, I was so scared to do it. And now I, and so it certainly cost me my courage, right? Mm -hmm. I was terrified. Best thing that ever happened. Mm. Like best thing hands down that ever happened to my career. It was going into this bank and being with this team and putting trust in them, right? That does seem quite fortunate. Generally, when you hear about acquisitions, I wouldn't say that the norm is for people to say that it's a great thing on the backside. So. Yeah, which is why I was terrified to do it. Right. <laughs> terrified to do it. You had a reasonable basis of fear, but Yeah. But you know, I it I had to um I had to face the fear and go in. I had many other options to go elsewhere with all these promises. But at the end of the day, I really looked at it like, well, they're all including this bank, right? It was all promising me the same thing. Just gotta have some faith. And so I and that's where my relationships were. I stayed with it and put the trust in them and pays off tenfold. What would you say to a vendor in this space that's new, that's ambitious, is trying to figure things out, how to stand out? What's the playbook that you would commend for success here? I think just don't try to know it all. Hmm. Tell me more. Like I said, I'm not a banker. I'm a property management banker. Mm -hmm. If the property management industry went away tomorrow, I probably won't be a banker. It's not... That's just not, I don't lead with banking. That's mm -hmm. not what I do, right? It, I think I I think it's really important to be really good at what you do and, and, and be, you're just as much of a consultative resource if you say to them, I don't know the answer to that because they're asking about maintenance and property management, right? Or they're asking about security deposit alternatives. Security al deposit alternatives is linked to banking and accounting, but that's not what I do. So you're just as much of a consultative resource. You say, I don't know that. I'm going to bring you here. Because if you say, I don't know this, but I know this really well, mm -hmm. they're not going to think that you're just being a salesperson trying to yes them to death. They're going to, like, re then what you do know really well, they're going to trust in you. Mm -hmm. And they're, I mean, I think I've done a good job at that. I think I've done a good job. Like, people know that you, you pro property management banking questions go to Allison. Mm -hmm. um, because I do that really well, and I don't try to know everything about everything else. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable saying, I don't know that. I'm going to help you with this, and I'm going to be the professional, and I'm going to be the best at this. Your credi credibility actually goes up. Your credibility goes up, because then they, well, of course, your credibility goes up because you're letting them know, like, you're not yesing them to death, right? But also because it, now you've expanded more space to just know this really well, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's just, this knowledge is going to get better and better and better. Because I'm not focusing on all the other things around it, mm. focusing on this. So can I be a part of all the big mastermind conversations about all the other things? Mm -hmm. No. But everyone's going to come to me to talk about this because they know that I know this. I can talk about it with my eyes closed for days, which would be boring as hell for those customers to talk about property management banking. But that's what I know more than anything. I find sometimes people want me to get out of my lane. Yeah. People, people like want me to comment on things that I don't know about. All the time. And I don't understand. <laughs> and I resist the yeah. temptation. And I'm really comfortable just saying like, hey, you know what you're asking me about? That's important. That's worthwhile. And I can point you to some people that probably have some great answers. 
I'm not going to wade into that, even though you want me to. And even though whatever I would tell you, you would nod your head at and maybe find useful. Right. It's not really my zone of expertise. Right. I'm doing that Keep. for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm getting something out of staying laser focused on right. my zone of expertise. Right. People want to talk to me about like maintenance mortgage or like mortgages. And I, I mortgages. I, I don't know. Sorry. Like I don't I don't have it for you. Like we are a bank. We do mortgages. I don't touch them. And I realize it's related to real estate investing uh -huh. and property management. Don't touch them. I will send you that way. I'm the last person that should be speaking on that type of stuff because I really don't, I don't try to know it all. I mean, it's interesting because my husband, for instance, I actually think this is a strength of his, but my husband, if he doesn't know something, he's, he's just curious. And actually, I think you're very curious too, but he is just curious. So if he's, if you're talking to him about something that he doesn't know and understand, he will have a book out later that night trying to learn everything about that, even though he may never need that information. Mm -hmm. And it's not even to be able to then get back to that person, that specific person who talked about it. He just is curious and he wants to know more. I honestly am not like that. Sometimes I think it's a character flaw, but when it comes to business and what I do, I actually think it's a good thing. Know this really well. Know the parts of it that you need. You know, there are some ancillary parts to it that you need to know, um, but don't try to know it all. Don't try to know everything around it because it can get messy and those those industries are ever changing right like i need to know what i know what i need to focus on and what's going to make me successful and also provide the best value back to my customers which then also by the way gives them more trust in me mm. because i've i'm just a good resource on that I'm, I'm a great resource on that specific subject let's end it here if there's one piece of advice that you could give your younger self what would it be on this so hard um, I just keep going back to in my head, just have more faith in you, not others. Mm. Don't put so much pressure on everyone else to make it right for you. Mm. Have more faith that you can do it. Mm. Ah, agency, mm -hmm. locus of control. Man, the idea of agency, me having agency, me being able to change things, mm -hmm. including the idea of blaming myself, mm -hmm. because if I'm the problem, I can change. Yeah. If other people are the problem, good luck. I right. love that piece of advice. Yeah. Works for me. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate Thanks the way you show me. up in our industry, the way you're supporting these people. Thank you for having me. Love the conversation. Thanks. Until next time. Right back at you. All right. That's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. You can check out other episodes along the way. If you're watching this on YouTube, appreciate to subscribe. Any comments, I'm always here to engage. If you're listening on an audio platform, we'd really appreciate a review. It's a great way to help other people find out about the show.